real quick announcement um, after service today. Uh, we're going to go down in the fellowship hall and have some cake for uh, Frank and, and Trina's anniversary and for Frank's birthday. So you guys could stick around. We'll be eating some cake. But first off, let's, uh, let's get fed with God's Word this morning. So let's all stand up, please, for the reading in the book of 1 Corinthians. If you have a Bible in the pew, that's page number... 1521. So we just finished off 1 Corinthians chapter 10 last week. Moving on to chapter 11. And uh, this is why I really enjoy going through the Bible verse by verse. And when you go through and learn the Bible verse by verse, you're bound to come across every topic under the sun. And some topics are deep and mysterious, and other topics are straightforward and, and practical. And that's what we'll be, we'll be getting into this morning. Uh, so let's read, I'm going to read the passage here briefly. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even as all one as if, it, if she were shaven. For if the woman were not covered, let her also be shorn. But if, she be, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves. Is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is her glory to her, for her hair is given for her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have such no custom, neither the churches of God. Brother Frank, would you mind opening us up in a word of prayer, please? Amen. All righty. You know, may all be seated. Now, there's two main lessons within this portion of Scripture. Number one, the headship of authority, all right, that being Christ, then the man, then the woman. Now, you remember that illustration uh, we talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where we uh, brought up, I think we, had, we set up Tone, he was Lord Jesus Christ, and I pray that the Lord forgives me for that. <laughs> and then we had, the, then we had the, the man, who I believe was John Paul, and then we had the woman, was Miss Trina. Then we had the, the child who was Luke. No disrespect, Luke. You got the idea, though. But we had that line of that, that you could visually see it. You had Christ. You had that whole order. That's how it's supposed to be. And then we jumbled it all up and we put, you know, the child was in the front, you know, the child rolling over the parents, and then the woman uh, with, with no protection, that line of protection. You could look just look at it visually and see that was all out of place there. Okay, there's, there's a structure on how God wants things to be. And uh, while well, this structure is brought up once again in chapter 11, now the second lesson is on head coverings and haircuts. So if I had the title for this morning's sermon, it would be Haircuts in the Headship of Christ. Haircuts in the Headship of Christ. So before we get into the, uh, the, uh, the rest of the portion of Scripture talking about those things, let's uh, start off on verse number 1. Chapter 11, verse number 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as, even as I also am of Christ. Now, if you come back to chapter 4, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, a couple pages to the left, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16, Paul says it again. He says, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Okay? And if you want to write these references down, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul is always telling them, he's instructing the fellow Christians around at that time even, 
to follow the Apostle Paul. Okay? Now, when we say follow Paul, we're talking about following him in his beliefs. What does the Apostle Paul believe? And in his conduct. It's, it's following Paul in his doctrine, which is belief in your manner of living. So, uh, the, now the principle to get from that is there's, there's nothing wrong with following a man in Christ. Now, uh, Paul, he warned about earlier in this book that we're not to build our faith upon man. Okay, so you ought to be careful about making people that you follow into sinless heroes, okay? And there won't be a hero that you ever picked in this whole world that doesn't have some type of kink in his armor or, or a hole in his armor or something like that. So everybody that you follow, obviously, is a, if they're a man, well, they're, they're still sinful, okay? So, um, but with, with that in mind, it's all right to follow a good man that loves the Lord that, and that follows the Lord. But once again, note that they're just a man, okay? And uh, I, I, I want to bring up, I do follow and teach a lot of the same things that, that Dr. Ruckman teaches. And, uh, and, when, and, and I've listened to a lot of men that he taught. And, you know, I've been told before, well, you know, you're just following a man. You're just following a man and stuff. And, well, okay, yeah, that's true to a point. But where, where you know, and uh, where the man lines up with the Bible, well, then I'll follow him. And where the man doesn't line up with the Bible, who do you think I'm going to side with? <laughs> and I'm going to side with God's book. So that's, it's, it's that simple. Uh, you know, do, do I believe that Dr. Ruckman was one of the greatest Bible teachers America saw? Of course I do. I, I do believe that. Uh, do I believe he was right on everything? Of course not. <laughs> he can't be. You know, he can't be right on everything. Uh, he, he was off on a few things. But so is every man. You're never going to find a perfect Christian leader, perfect pastor that's right 100% on their doctrine all the time. Uh, and you also got to be careful with those who say, well, my only teacher is the Holy Ghost. Okay, and, and then they're quote you John 14, 26, where the Holy Spirit teaches you all things. And that's kind of a pious, ignorant thing to say, where they just, well, just the Holy Ghost is my teacher. I'm in subjection to no man. No man teaches me nothing. Already, it's like, oh, uh, you got a bit of hard-headedness. you got to be taught from some men. Okay, now the Holy, the Holy Ghost certainly teaches you through the vessels of men. Acts 13.1 Now there were some church at the church of Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 28 God hath set forth some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. 1 Corinthians 12.29 Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Ephesians 4.11 He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. If the Holy Ghost does not use teachers to teach men, then why would, you know, why would Paul take the time out to tell you a teacher is an office in the local church? So there's teachers, and that's how the Holy Spirit will use a man to, to teach you certain things. And when you have a person just preaching you know, far out, wacky things that, know, that he claimed to only get, that God only showed him, and he, you know, that's all their ministry is, is about all the things that God showed them and showed them, and just it's all these far out things, I'd be careful with, with somebody like that, where they, they never heard it from, you know, man before, it's just their own little thing. That's kind of like how cults get started, where it's only, you know, God's only working with me, He's only showing me certain things. I'd be careful with that, okay? Now, uh, obviously, um, you know, does God show me things in, in Scripture that I've never heard before? Yeah, of course He does. God shows me small little things, but for the majority of all the things that I learned throughout the, God's book, I sat down and listened to Dr. Ruckman and, and David Peacock and all the men that, that pretty much Dr. Ruckman trained, okay? So I learned a lot from, from men. And every here and there, Lord will show me some couple little things that, you know, I'd like to share with everybody, and that, that's all right. But um, for the most part, though, I learned a lot from Bible-believing men who love the Lord. So that's why I esteem them high and give, give credit to where it's due and stuff. Now, obviously, the role is that you cannot put any man before God, that's where Paul would, would rebuke the Corinthians for doing and stuff. And uh, there's nothing wrong with following man when he is doing the right thing. Like if you want to learn how to play a piano, well then you're going to probably spend time following Bach and Mozart and Beethoven and things like that. Or if you want to know how to shoot a basketball or whatever, you're probably going to watch some Michael Jordan, probably watch Steph Curry and things like that. I don't know. We've got basketball players in here. I don't know who you watch anymore these days. But if you want to learn how to throw a football, you're probably going to look up Tom Brady and Drew Brees and things like that, and you know, follow their patterns and you know, pattern your 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 the way that you do things after those certain men. If you want to learn how to swing a golf club, you're probably going to follow Arnie Palmer or my dad back there. <laughs> you know, probably follow him. But 
you, you guys get the point, though. It's okay with, fo with following men if they're doing the right thing, okay? Um, and if you want to learn God's Word, then follow men who believe God's book and teach it and preach it rightly divided. You've got to rightly divide the, the Bible, okay? Now, are all those men sinless? Well, of course not, okay? So, do, do some preachers say and do just downright stupid things? Yeah, of course they do, <laughs> Okay, uh, well, you say, well, why do they do that? Why do, they, why do preachers say dumb things? Because they're flesh. They're still flesh. And we're, we're not on some exalted level, some angelic class of being up, up here. We're still flesh. So, um, and I've learned to take the good and leave the bad. It's, it's that simple. And there are some things that Dr. Ruckman and even you know, Dr. Peacock would say that I would never say <laughs> up behind the pulpit. I, w I, just, I just couldn't say those things. And as much as I esteem God's men that, that he uses to teach and preach his book, I obviously know that none of them are sinless. I don't hold them that high, okay? So Paul says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And Paul's saying, he's saying, look, I'm the example. Now, we clearly know that Paul wasn't sinless. Paul says, the good that I, the good that I would, I don't do, but the evil that I would not, that I do. What's Paul saying there? He still sins. He shouldn't sin. But Paul still has this nature, the Adamic nature, that is in sinful flesh. And uh, Paul, the Holy Ghost said, Paul, don't you go down to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. What happened? Paul went to Jerusalem. He disobeyed the, he disobeyed the Holy Ghost at times. Now, how many, how many of you ever done that? <laughs> of course. I mean, you know, we've got to humble ourselves. Of course we have disobeyed the Holy Ghost at times. But, um, but at the same time, though, he says, Be ye followers of me as I also am of Christ. But the point is you're going to find kinks in the armor of, of men, okay? and Because the Bible says all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass, okay? So everybody's, everybody's corrupted in some way. Um, now, uh, now, look at verse number two here. Now he says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. Okay, now when it, comes to, when it comes to our church, we believe in two ordinances. We believe in the Lord's Supper. We believe in water baptism. Anybody wants to get water baptized? Well, what's water baptism? It's, it's, a, it's a picture of something that happened to you spiritually. The water baptism doesn't save you. In bar, in, by partaking of the, the Lord's Supper, the juice and the, and the bread, by taking those elements, that don't save you. Just what Jesus Christ did, death, burial, and resurrection. And trust and put your faith on what He did. That's what saves you. But those are two ordinances that... We keep in remembrance of him. And we would practice water baptism because it shows something physically. You were put down into the water, then you were raised up out of the water. You know, it, was, it, it pictures the death, burial, and resurrection. And that's something that, that's, that spiritually happened in you when you got born again. Um, now, Paul talks about ordinances. Come to Colossians. Come to Colossians. So there's New Testament ordinances. Come to Colossians chapter 2. That's page 1568. There's New Testament ordinances, and then there's also Old Testament ordinances. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse number 14. Colossians 2, 14. Look what this says here. It says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So there's certain ordinances that the Lord Jesus Christ literally took out of the way. And you keep reading this chapter, that's temporarily. Those ordinances and them Sabbath days and them new moons, they're a shadow of things to come. That's why you look up at the millennium where Jesus Christ sets up his thousand year reign, all those things come back. How many of you could keep the law in order to get yourself to heaven? You can't. You can't keep the law to get yourself to heaven. Christ had to come down and fulfill the law that all who believe upon him will have, uh, will have promise of eternal life, okay? So those ordinances are taken out of the way, which Paul's talking about Old Testament ordinances. Now come to the book of Acts chapter 15. So there's old, now the, the word ordinance is mentioned throughout the Old Testament 48 times, okay? That's Old Testament ordinances. Those are the laws and statutes and all that. But come to Acts chapter 15 verse 28. I believe these are also some uh, ordinances in the local church that Paul's talking about here. Look at Acts 15. It's page 1459, Acts 15, verse uh, 28. Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden 
than these necessary things. So Paul's about to give you some ordinances. These are necessary things in the, in the New Testament. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols. Well, remember 1 Corinthians was all about that. that we, we spent three weeks about, remember those meats being offered up to idols? And how actually them Corinthians, it's best off to just avoid it altogether. You may have the liberty to eat that animal that was offered to an idol. Because an, an idol is nothing. It's just a piece of meat. But for the sake of testimony and for the sake of other people looking at you, for your witness of Christ, I don't even want to go down into the pagan halls or into the pagan meat market and part be anywhere near that stuff, okay? So Paul says that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood. That's always an interesting thing. Abstain from, like, drinking blood. Now that's something that was told before the law, during the law, and after the law, which is you're not to drink blood. Okay, so that's a, that was, that's a commandment. And from things strangled. It was always another interesting. We, abstain from things strangled. I don't know, could that be the method on how they were killing the animals or something like that? Uh, I was I'm, I'm always uh, tricked about what, what does it mean from, by things strangled. I'd do more studying on that. And here's a clear one. And from fornication. Four necessary things that you Gentiles, after you get saved, you ought to be able to abstain from. Uh, I'm not trying to get you back under the Jewish law of all these 613 statues and all that, but there's four necessary things that you Gentiles should be able to abstain from. Okay? Those are the things there. But look what he says. For which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare ye well. Don't say if you keep those things, you're going to, get, you're going to go to heaven, but if you keep them things, you're going, to do, you're going to do yourself well to stay away from them. Okay? Now, those are the ordinances. Come back to uh, 1 Corinthians. And we're going to spend next week, we'll do the Lord's Supper next week, because we're getting into that chapter, Chapter uh, the rest of the chapters talking about the Lord's Supper. And of course, Paul corrects them uh, with, with their practice of the Lord's Supper. But there's two ordinances. Now, since the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, those two ordinances pretty much show the gospel. Okay, those two ordinances. The, the, the Lord's Supper would show it would set forth his death, okay? And then the, the baptism, practice the ordinance of baptism, that would set forth his, his, his burial and his resurrection. That's why those two ordinances, they're, they're good to keep. And um, we don't go as far as the hyper-dispensationalists, which if you don't know what that means, go uh, watch my YouTube video on, you know, on the heresy of hyper-dispensationalism. And there'll be a group of people out there that teach, now you don't, Lord's Supper, that's not for you. Water baptism, you know, that's not for you at all. Now, that's to the far extreme, okay? So, you've got to have the balance with the things, okay? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Now, what we're about to get into, we're about to get into some customs, some custom things. Now, what's that? It's, it's a frequent or common use or practice. Um, but before we get into the customs of, ha of haircuts and head coverings, we gotta, we got to know the spiritual idea behind haircuts and head coverings. There's a spiritual idea um, ab about those practices here, okay? Look at chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of, and the, head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Okay, so there, once again, the order is man is God, man, and then the woman, okay? Um, and they talk about the whole, you know, woman's lib and, and, and just all the, it's really God, God's he's male lib, he's man lib, if you think about it. It's always, it's always the man and then below the woman and not to reverse such order and obviously God um, being the top. Now, man's supposed to be over the woman and then you look at in, in the book of um, Isaiah, write it down, Isaiah chapter 3 verse 12, it says, what was one of the downfalls of the nation of Israel that said that the woman rolled over them and the children were their oppressors. I mean, that's pretty big. A downfall of a nation is when the women are rolling over the men, no men are around, and then the children are oppressing, you know, the, the, the older people. That shouldn't be the way that things should be like that. And you, it's, you, you look at the state of our country now. <laughs> I mean, we got the first woman vice president. And the, the world is, high, what, what's it? She, there, she's highly esteemed. Yes, finally, a woman in the, in the office. A wo what do you mean? A woman in the office? That's no good. 
that's going to be a, you know, then you got the, a woman governing a, over a group of men like that in a, in a leader a position of high authority you got to be careful about that that was one of the downfalls of the nation of Israel that, that God gave a warning to and uh, I believe our nation's almost on the brink of collapse within the next five to ten years or so I'm not too sure but you can see how this thing's going financially economically and all that but the Lord said now the reason that a, that a, that a man is to row over the woman and is for the for the man is not of the woman but the woman of the man. That's verse 8. So Adam is not made from Eve, but Eve came from Adam. All right? And the Lord didn't tell Eve, Eve, you know, I will make you a helpmeet. No, he said that to Adam. That Adam, I will make you a helpmeet. Okay? And when the devil, when he wanted to mess up mankind and literally get mankind to rebel against God, who, who did he come to? He, he came to the woman. Okay? And uh, in 1 Timothy 2, verse... Uh, 14, he says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in transgression. So in other words, Adam, as a type of Christ, willingly laid down his life to continue to have fellowship with his wife. He wasn't deceived. It wasn't like she said, oh, check out this, you know, look at this fruit, and, and she tried to, you know, deceive him. He knew exactly what he was getting into when he partook of the fruit of the tree. Okay, Eve did it, and Adam, as a pitcher, Look, i got to die for you. That's a picture of Christ having to die for the church. Okay, um, So Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And it says that Eve was beguiled. She was tricked. She was seduced by obviously what she heard. Okay, The devil was a, was a smooth talker and, and, and deceived her to rebel against God and uh, beguiled her. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. So Paul's going to get into dealing with problems that occur when the positions of the man and woman in the body of Christ and in the local church are out of place. He's going to get ready to address these certain things. So look at chapter 11, verse number 4. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So that indicates if any man's praying or he's prophesying, for example, or if he's, even if he's preaching, every Christian, we'll always remember that, Every Christian, in a sense, is a prophet. Okay, I'm not talking about this extra biblical, the Lord told me he wants you to go here and he wants you to do this and only God's speaking to me and I'm getting all this extra biblical revelation. Uh -uh. Every person, if you're saved, you know where you're going when you die. You know future events. You say, well, how do you know all this stuff? It's because of God's Word. And the Holy Spirit will bear witness you know, that, these, that these things are true. So you, can, you have the ability to foretell the future. It's in accordance with God's book. It's not palm reading or divination or fortune telling in that sense, but it lines up with God's book. So the idea is if, you're, if, if I'm up here and I, and I got a hat on or something and I'm preaching, or, uh, preaching or, or praying that you're dishonoring your head. It's like there's something that by having a hat on and, and this is a custom practice type thing. To this day, you stand up and do the national anthem. What do you do? You take off your hat. You come into a building. You take off your hat. So we, we continued. America kept some of them customs. And it's the same thing behind when you're preaching in a local church. You don't put, keep a hat on, okay, as a man, because your head represents Christ. Okay, and that would, that would be a picture. That I got a, something over top of Christ. Okay, so there would be something that would be in the way there of, of, of Christ, kind of hiding them and covering them. Now, this is contrary to the Old Testament, because in the Old Testament, the, the, uh, in the Jewish priesthood, they would wear what was called a, a, mit a mitre. I always have, I don't always know how to pronounce it. M I T R E. Is it mitre or mitre? I always tend to always just look, say it how it is, mitre. But it's a mitre. Um, and it was, a, it, was this, it was this hat. It was just this Jewish garb that they'd go on. And, uh, and, it, they, and remember, the Jews had to have certain attire that they had to wear. And, you know, and then you look at the Roman Catholic Church and stuff, they just completely hijacked all the things. From the Old Testament, you never catch Paul wearing a mitre on his head. <laughs> you never catch Peter or nothing dressed in his glorious attire and things of that sort. You don't find that in the New Testament. Um, that, so that's, that's something that's completely different. So then let's look. So that's the idea of the man. Verse 4 Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Okay, that's not saying you wear a hat so long and you're dishonoring your head and you're going to grow, go bald because all you do is wear a hat. There's a spiritual principle there, okay, that, 
you're, you, you have this hat on, you're covering, in a sense, you're covering Christ, which is your head. The head of the man is Christ. Now, verse number 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. Now, that's, there's something different there. She has to have a head covering. Her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. So when a woman prays or prophesied, she is to have some type of covering on her head. And if she doesn't have a covering on her head, it's pretty much the same as if she was just all completely just shaved, all completely just shorn. She'd better off just be all shaved and shorn if she don't have no covering on her head. Um, so the, the idea is they, that a woman should wear some type of uh, veil unless they have long hair. Look at verse number 15. If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Look at it. For her hair is given her for a covering. Now, some churches practice that. Some churches practice. Look, you ladies, you better come in with a veil on your head. Now, that they, obviously, they would get this from this passage. But you've got to have a balance with that. Your hair is given for a covering too. And I'm not going to bash or slam anybody that, look, you want to wear a veil? Go ahead, wear a veil. Okay? But, and if you, if you have hair, that's the Bible says, if your hairs are covering, that's good. And it says that the, that's the glory of, of a woman and things. So look at uh, verse number 5, uh, verse number 6 even. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Okay? Now, the idea is if a woman will not keep her head covered, okay, either by a head covering or by long hair, then Paul says, cut off all the hair. Let it be shorn. But if it's a shame for a woman uh, to, for, to be shaved or shorn, then she better cover up her head some way. Okay? In some of the old time, the holiest woman, they would brag about, you know, having their hair down past the middle of their back. And they would all talk about, well, you know, if, if the hair is down past the middle, the, the, the longer their hair, the more spiritual that they were. And once again, they would get this from this passage here. And uh, that's, you got, you got to watch out going too far with that. Because obviously, you know, long hair, that could be just as much of a display of vain glory than if you was to have short hair. You know, it's, it's just, so that, that's, that's not the right thing either. Now, look at verse number seven. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Okay? A man ought indeed don't cover your head when you're praying or prophesying because you get the picture. Christ is supposed to be your head. Okay? A woman is supposed to have her, her veil on her, her hair because that's representing she's under something. She's under the man. The, under the man. Okay? So, the man's under God then the woman's under the man. Now, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head. Now, here's something interesting. There's two, two things about this verse here. There's a doctrinal meaning and then there's something practical that we can get out of it. Verse number 7, For a man indeed not to cover his head. For as much as he, he is the image and glory of God. Now that's something. That shows you that when you're saved, you're born again child of God and you got saved, you put your faith and trust in what Christ did for you, you regained that image that Adam lost. We know that Adam was created in God's image. And then when Adam had kids, Seth shows up and says that Seth was after his own image. Seth was born in the image of Adam. Now all of us in this world continue to get birth into the world. People are born in Adam. They're born in the image of Adam. Something is missing. That the spirit is born dead in trespasses and sins. So I understand you're born in this, after the similitude of God. All men, all women, everybody has a body, soul, and spirit. But they're born with a fallen spirit, which needs to be regenerated and brought back to life again, reborn. So in, in once you get born again, you gain that image back. Okay, You gain that lost image. Because um, the Bible says we sin because we are in Adam. We die because we're in Adam. But then once you receive Christ, you're no longer in Adam. Then Paul talks about being in Christ. 
Okay, that's the doctrinal uh, idea about the thing. And um, the, we, we learned about in Colossians 1.27 that Christ is in you, okay, and you're in Christ. So when God looks at a, a saved man, or a saved woman even, that they see the image of God is there. It's restored. It's brought back, okay? Um, and then, uh, you know, and then people say, well, what about the fact that we're still in a sinful body? What about that? Okay, well, the, that's the whole idea about the spiritual circumcision in Colossians chapter 2, how God divides the old, the Adamic nature and cuts that away from Christ's nature, the new man which is inside of you. There's a division there. There's a circumcision there, the, a cutting away of something that's spiritual. I mean, there's no other way to say it. It's not a physical circumcision like it was in the Old Testament. It's a spiritual circumcision which, is happen which happens to both man and woman. And that's something that, that Christ separates that fleshy nature that we still have that where there's something inside of us that's actually sinless. People talk about sinless perfectionism and stuff. There's a piece of me that's sinless and that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's not your flesh that's sinless. You have an incorruptible seed inside of you. And then one day God's going to change our vile bodies. That's the opinion of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are vile. I'm not going to argue with it, okay? Our bodies are vile and He's going to change the image of our, of our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious image, okay? We get a changed body at the rapture. Now, then practically, look, let's look at the rest of verse number 7. For as much as He is the image of and glory of God. Now it's talking about the man. This goes back to the goes back to the Garden of Eden. Man is the image of and glory of God. Okay. Then it says, but the woman is the glory of the man. Okay. Now practically, uh, that verse is pretty much saying when those things are out of order, like when a country or when a people start to glorify a woman. Really, you're glorifying man because it says, but the woman is the glory of the man. So when the, when the women start to be in charge and the, and the men are lower, you look around all the churches, you know, the, the, the women preachers and stuff. And that's not, and people say, well, that's just how it was back in the day. Well, where do you stop then? Oh, homosexuality and all that stuff, that was just something back in the day, but we got we to gotta accept it now. You know, and oh, they, they believed in the literal six-day creation back in the day, but... Now, we've got to believe in evolution. Where, where would you stop with all that? God's book never changes. And the Bible says, that it, I, I suffer women not to teach or usurp authority above a man. So there's a, there's a position of order. So in, it's like when a, when a woman gets glamorized and glorified in society, it's almost like saying, once again, man is the measure of all things. It's like man is the glory when that's not how it should be. A man indeed not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Okay? Now look at verse number 8. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. There's the reason why. Okay? Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Once again, God saw down at, he looked down at, at Adam and there was no help meet for him. And he said, i got to make you a help me. That guy needs some help right there. I'm going to end up helping him. And it wasn't reversed. It wasn't that, that Eve needed a help me. Okay, so that's just, that's just how it was. And uh, all modern and, and, and liberal Christian women, they think, well, just because I get saved, I'm, I'm equal to my husband now. And I could, you know, I'm just, I could, I, could, I could roll my house and roll over my husband because I'm saved. And it says we're all in one. Whoa, whoa. The Bible, the spiritual equality in Christ but them physical distinctions, still they still are, are on on ground. You know what I'm saying? That's not the, like the Bible says. For for there's neither male nor female, bond or free, Jew nor Greek. You're all one in Christ Jesus. That don't mean when you get saved in jail, you're a free man. <laughs> that don't mean that you know you get saved. Oh, there's no difference between a male and female no more. <laughs> this is spiritual. You got to you got to rightly divide the spiritual and the physical. Just well, I got saved. I could go and use the ladies' bath restroom now. <laughs> That's not how the thing works, okay? That's not how it works at all. So that, that's, that's nuts, all that stuff. Now, look at verse number, uh, verse number 10. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Then it says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. 
Yeah, that's one of the wildest, one of the wildest verses in the Bible. All right? I, I don't got this thing completely figured out at all. But it says, this caused that the woman have power on her head. Okay, now notice a woman's power comes from being created for the man. Okay, when a woman is truly exercising her power, it's not when she is an independent woman. And it's not when she is rolling her husband and rolling her household. Or it's not when... Uh, you know, she's in a high position of society. You know, what, you know, empower the, the women and things. What makes a woman powerful is when she is in subjection under a man and giving the glory back to where she came from. I mean, that's, isn't that something, ladies? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, you know, preaching at the, at the ladies and stuff like that this morning, but you got to understand this is, this is Bible, okay? And obviously people would get very offended <laughs> of, of all these, uh, of, of this kind of talk and things. Now, there's two interpretations of this verse here that, that we're going to go with. Now, for this cause, the woman have power on her head because of the angels. Now, when it comes to, okay, first interpretation is that when a woman doesn't cover her head, okay, doesn't cover her head with a veil or with long hair or she's under a man, being the head as the covering, then it's a sign that she's in rebellion against authority. All right? And, and it's somehow that it reminds the angels of their rebellion against God's authority. Now, that's, that's kind of wild. I understand. Uh, what's that mean? Does that mean there's a bunch of angels and watchers looking down, and when they, when they see a woman that has short hair or a woman that isn't in subjection under the man, then it reminds them, hey, back in Genesis 6, we came down into the daughters of men. And most, you know, I would believe most, obviously, most of those women probably didn't have no head covering in a sense that they didn't have a husband to protect them. So what happened in Genesis 6? It said the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore great giants unto them. <laughs> so it's like something about a woman's hair and her covering that gives them power because of the angels. Okay, that's, that's about as, as, uh, as far as... Um, the, the, yeah, the next inter interpretation is that when the angels came down, they saw that the woman had no head covering, whether that be veil, her hair, or whether that be the woman had no husband, so they took advantage of the lady, okay, because she had no covering. That's about the best thing you can do with that verse. For there, this caused out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Then it says, verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Okay, so there you go. Now it's saying, and Paul goes and says about it, that there wouldn't be a man sitting here today that didn't come from Eve, the mother of all living. There wouldn't be a, ma a, a man sitting here today that didn't come from their, their, uh, their mother. Okay, and as a child, you're to owe your, your mother with obedience and to obey her. You know, children, obey your, uh, obey your parents in the Lord for this, this, is, this is acceptable in the Lord. So that's something that a child has to do. They're under sub subjection to their mother. Every man sitting here came from a woman, obviously. And, um, and when you get, then when you get married, the love that you gave to your mother then belongs to your wife. Okay, so then, then, then things will, will change there. So, verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man. So you see the order? Okay, woman came from man, but then you men came from woman. Neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Okay, they both are accepted in the Lord, the idea is. Then verse 12, for, for as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now, what that's kind of teaching is saying like, look, once a man is in subjection to, to God, and once a woman's in subjection to to her husband, both are being in subjection to the Lord. So it all gets traced back to your, your obligations um, to you know, your, your Creator when it's all said and done. But all things uh, of God, okay? It's giving you the order, then it says that all things of God. So then here's, here's where the, the, bulk of the, the bulk of the message comes in, okay? That was just kind of a long introduction. Now, uh, verse 13 Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? So now Paul's saying you judge the matter now, okay? Paul wants them to use their common sense. 
And after all that he said, does, does, it, does it seem right that a woman should not have a covering on her head when she's praying? Okay, so then verse 14. He's, then he lays out his case. Okay. Doth not even nature itself teach you? You know what that says? That tells you that nature is a teacher. Uh, you can write down two verses. Write down Romans 1.26 and Romans 1.27. Okay? You know why what that says? It says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. That's Romans 1.26. Women changing the natural use, and then they went after women. Where there goes your lesbianism. Romans chapter 1. Which was going on since... Sodom and Gomorrah, which was going on in the pagan days, which runs clear through in the modern days. Okay? Romans 1.26, and it says, Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust one toward another, working that which is unseemly. So then you got men with men, which is unnatural. So there's things that you could look around and nature will tell you it. Okay? You, know, uh, you don't need to go to some liberal school or some secular school and tell you, no, nah, it's okay. They, that's their lifestyle. They're born that way. They're chosen that way. Nature itself teaches you that, look, if you got them all together up on an island and, and put them over there, that population would die. I mean, it's just how it is. You can't reproduce. Nature itself teaches certain things. Now, most of the time, that one's clear. Nature itself teaches you it's a male and female. That's it. There's no 20,000 different genders that they come up with a new one every week or nothing. That's not it. There's two. Okay? If People need to still hear that because people are falling for that whole propaganda mess. Now, that's, that may be clear. You can understand that. So then it's another thing. Another thing that, that is it maybe, not, maybe might not be so clear is that nature itself teaches you that it's actually a shame for a man to have long hair. It's a shame. And um, now, the, now, the, now the question comes up, well, how long is long? All right, you're going to get all kinds, we'll get all into a couple kinds of different arguments here and stuff. Well, you know, most people say if it covers the ears in the neck or the forehead, then it's woman's hair, okay? And uh, because a woman's hair is supposed to cover her ears and her neck and it's supposed to be her head covering, uh, then, then a, a man's not to have that type of hairstyle, okay? Now, people say this. So let's say, well, back in the day, them, them folks in the... 15, 1600, King, don't you know King James had a wig? <laughs> you know, it's, they're, they're going to pull all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, what about the founding fathers? They all had that nice powdered wig. They'd, powder, they'd put that powdered wig on their head and stuff. And they said, what, what about that? You know, yeah, are you going to walk around with a powdered wig on your head now? I mean, what, what do you do? But they're always trying to, to argue, hey, I'm going to have my long hair. I'm going to hold on to my long hair, okay? But they, they overlooked two facts that back in the day there was a barber shop. It wasn't, you don't, you don't find the supercuts in every single plaza, okay? Back in the day you had to travel for a barber. Back in the day them barbers were expensive. Not every man in cowboy or whatever or, or whatever could just afford to even go to the barber. They were pricey. And, uh, and another thing that the whole, that whole powder wig thing overlooked that they, they don't think about is that was a symbolic meaning of something. In Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 14 it says that Christ comes back with white hair. He comes back with white hair. So when they did that, when them people in high authority would put them powdered wig on, that was a symbolic representation of uh, as a as a thing of judging, as a thing of a ro I'm a roller in authority. Like, I believe they got that from the Bible with that white hair look. It was a thing of wisdom, and uh, as a, a politician or a lawyer or a king, that wasn't an excuse for some rebellious pot smoking hippie to grow out their hair long. <laughs> Obviously not. So they go back to, what about the George Washington? Great guy. He had long hair, powdered wig. That, 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 that don't work. Now, if you want to have long hair as a man, if you want to have long hair as a man, the question is, well, why do you want it? Why do you want it? And an old preacher once said, he said, you know, the, the Lord don't care about what you do. The Lord cares about why do you do what you do. All right? He don't care about what you do. But why are you doing it? There goes the motive of the thing, okay? Why do you do what you do? It's all about the motive. Now, why do you want long hair? Why do you want to dye it pink or purple um, or blue or blonde and stuff? Well, why do you want to do it? Do you want to do it because you want to look cool? Do you want to do it because you want to look different? Do you want to do it because you want to attract attention to yourself? Is that why you're, you're doing it? Do you want to be noticed for being different in things? 
or, you know, or do you want long hair because you don't have a barber shop around within 100 miles and because you're going to live in the Arctic and because it's practical for your survival, I got to have long hair, I got to grow out the thick beard, then, okay, you can understand some of that stuff. But for the common, every ordinary man, why do you do one? Most of, most of the time, the why is because it's all about themselves. I think I look cool, I want to be noticed. I, and that's exactly what they did back in the 60s and 70s. It was a whole thing of rebellion. All right, we're going to... We'll get in a little bit of that. Now look at verse 11, verse, chapter 11, verse 15. If a woman have long hair, chapter 11, verse number uh, 14. If a woman have long hair, look at this. It is a glory to her. Ain't that something? Now, what is the woman's glory in, in a society? Is it her facial features? Is it her clothing style? Is it her figure? The Bible says it's her hair. <laughs> a woman's hair is their glory. Okay? Um, that's, that's what it says. In, uh, according to a woman's glory, is it's her hair. Something about that. Now, when you think of it, hair has always been considered one of the most prominent and important aspects uh, of our appearance. In all nation, uh, nations and cultures, and they, they give much attention to their hairstyle. Right, and that's probably one of the most first things that we notice about people is we notice their, their hair right away. Uh, some cultures, the, what, the women, would, they'd wear it bald. Okay, that wasn't a shame in their culture. They'd wear it bald. Okay, a lot of tribal lands and things like that. In other cultures, the men would grow out their, their hair long. Okay, um, you look, look big Native Americans and Japanese samurais and things like that. And, uh, so there's a thing of, of customs that gets involved in here, okay, which we, which we got to understand what, what custom are we living in in things like that today and stuff, which is, uh, which is very watery ground. That's why I'm not a big preacher on preaching standards and preaching dress codes and haircuts and you ain't coming to my church unless your hair is this length, unless you're wearing this certain attire. I mean, I, that goes borderline legalistic, so I, I try to leave it up to, you know, between one another. I mean, we have conversations like this all the time. The, the preacher's job is, you know, to, to watch over my wife, and I can't be getting involved in, yeah, your wife isn't, well, what are you looking at my wife for and stuff? I mean, you, you know, that's, and then it gets, like, weird. So I try not to, to get too much involved with other people's attire and, and hairstyles and stuff, but this is, it's in this chapter, so we, we got to go over this stuff. So uh, in, the Uni in the United States, women traditionally, they would allow their hair to grow naturally long, all right? And then... It drastically changed in the 1920s, in, in, uh, in, in the 30s. The women, they chopped their hair, and they got what's called a bob cut, all right? And ladies, cutting their hair off was popularized by a film star. <laughs> Who could have guessed that? Hollywood having an influence over modern society, <laughs> still to this day. That hair, that uh, hairstyle, bob cuts, was, it was influenced by a film star, Mary Thurman. How many of you know about Mary Thurman? I was way, I'm way before anybody. It's 1920s. Mary Thurman, early 1920s, and Colleen Moore and Louis, Louis Brooks in the mid-late 1920s. Now, it is seen as somewhat of a shocking statement of independence in young women. As older women, we're used to seeing girls wearing long dresses in, in heavy uh, Edwardian hairstyle. Okay? That's what, that was what, how it was back then. So that was with the ladies. Then, uh, then you look at, throughout the what is it, 30s, 40s, 50s, that most of the women, they cut off all their hair, all right? Then shows up in the 1960s and 70s, which I noticed people born in here in the 1960s and 70s, they might not have been around in the, in the 20s at all yet, but then the 60s and 70s, thanks again, once the social icons, like the Beatles, okay, there goes, uh, there goes your, your, your music industry and your entertainment industry always have an effect on society. So 1960s, 70s comes along and you got the Beatles. And the men grew their hair as long as the women. All right? And uh, you, you could see that things were beginning to get flipped. Things were getting flipped. Now look at the state where we're at right now. They don't know what's going on. They don't know if I'm a boy or a girl. They don't know if my, where, where my hair is long or short, if it's pink or blue. I mean, things are so, it's a mess of confusion right now. So ladies chopped their hair off in the 20s. Then in the 60s and 70s, men grew their hair out long. Okay? Now, longer hair in general remained popular to the youth due to the youth rebellion 
throughout the liberal decade of the 1960s. The long hair trend grew, with, it grew within and spread of the, within the hippie movement in the 60s and 70s, and, and longer hairstyles would have become the norm among men and women. Then the ladies back in the day in the 60s and 70s, they're growing their hair out just as long. So then you look at a man and a woman, and they're standing behind, and I don't know what he is anymore. <laughs> I don't know, what are they trying to be? Now there's, there's no difference at all. So they're, they're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a degeneration of society and morals and, and it's, it's, it's getting worse and worse to where we're at right now. You don't know who's waiting on you. If, if I would call them, thank you, ma'am. I was getting, getting told, I don't think she's a ma'am. I'm like, I said, thank you, ma'am. I don't know. I don't, and that's <laughs> to where we're at now. I, I, you know, that's, that should be polite, but it's getting to that point. There's no difference. So what does the Bible say about hair? We're going to cut it off. i got seven minutes. The Bible says, what does the Bible say about hair? Well, there's some, there's some men in the Bible most known for their long hair, all right? So which would be Samson and Absalom, all right? Now, Absalom, that was David's son. Now, you write down 2 Samuel 14, 26. You read about his hair. That guy had hair that weighed five pounds. That's a lot of hair, five pounds of hair, okay? Uh, and, and you know about Absalom? Absalom in the Bible is one of the greatest types of Antichrist. He was rebelling against he was rebelling against David, type of Christ. In in Absalom, he, he was he was beautiful and uh, his hair was nice and long and stuff. And his hair ended up getting in trouble. He ended up getting hung from a tree. They were riding out in battle, and then branches came up. It wrapped up his whole wrapped up his whole head, and they ended up killing him. His hair got him in big trouble there. Okay, uh, so he grew out his hair long, and there was no he was under no oath or nothing like that. He just grew it long because it looked good. I want to look good. I want to impress the people. All right, so that was, that, was, that was Absalom. That's 2 Samuel 18, 9. You can read about the death of him. Then Samson, he was told to grow his hair out long. He was told by God, okay? Under the law of Moses, a man who took a Nazarite vow, they were allowed to, for their hair to grow long until the end of the vow. Then they would shave it, okay? And, they, and you read that in Numbers chapter 6, verse 5. Uh, and then what happened, he ended up getting messing around with Delilah and stuff, and... Uh, end up chopped his hair off, and the next you know you got his eyes plucked out. Okay, and and he end up dying with his with his short hair. All right, but Samson it was a, he was under a certain vow. You know, men they got you ain't under no certain vow of where why the reason why you're growing your hair long. You didn't take a Nazar, Nazarite vow or nothing. Then Hannah, First Samuel chapter one verse eleven. Hannah she committed her son Samuel to a Nazarite uh, vow before his birth. So it could be inferred that Samuel had long hair. Now, then, possi then uh, possibly John the Baptist, who was also uh, a, a Nazarite. You write down Luke one, Luke chapter one, verse fifteen. And then, since Jesus never, and this is always a tough one. You know, it's hard to be completely dogmatic on it. Jesus, it's inferred he never drank wine. You find me one verse in the Bible where Jesus drank wine. He didn't. People say, well, he made wine. Okay, he made it. He said they were drinking wine at the Lord's Supper. Okay, they were drinking it. He said, I ain't going to drink this wine until I drink it new with you in my kingdom. Okay? So he never drank wine for what reason? Did, was he under a Nazarite vow? Possibly. But there's one thing for certain. Okay? And then, you know, now people like this in the old time, this is an old popular thing back in the fundamental Baptist movement where they thought that Jesus, he had short hair. So they paint these pictures that Jesus had short hair because it's a shame for men to have long hair. So that they'd advertise this Jesus with short hair. Okay? Now... I think that's a little too far because in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 26 and 27, Jesus was still an Orthodox Jew. Whether he was a Nazarite or not, take if he took the vow or not, he was still an Orthodox Jew. In Leviticus 19, 26 says, Don't eat nothing with blood. You shall not use enchantment or observe times. You shall not round the corners of your head. Neither shall you mar the corners of thy beard. I believe the Lord fulfilled that. I believe he kept that, that Orthodoxy in, in Judaism. Okay, so he had somewhat of a long hair. Now you say, well, why did, why did the Jews, why were they allowed to have long hair? The Bible says it's a shame. Don't nature teach you men should have long hair? The reason why the Lord uh, allowed them for, to have long hair because the Jews were a peculiar people to bear his shame and reproach. Okay? Um, it, it, now that's, that's the whole thing. Yet, now another thing they were told to do, which was against nature, was circumcision. Circumcision is against nature. You don't come out like that. And that was a custom that they said, look, that's what you do. And he, when he called them, uh, 
and when he called those people, he said, I'm calling you to be a peculiar people. So the reason for those exceptions, now remember, the exceptions don't override the general rule. Always remember that. That's an inductive method of reasoning where they try to find these exceptions and then that overrides the general rule. You know, a, a woman could beat up a man. So therefore, all women are stronger than men. No, it's generally taught throughout the ages of time men are dominant over the women. And then there's a rare, these rare cases where, yeah, a woman could, could do some damage to a man. Okay, I understand that. But it, uh, the reason for those exceptions for long hair and circumcision was because the Jews were are called to be a peculiar people. Okay, Acts chapter 18, verse number 8, or Acts 18, 18, Paul appears to have had some sort of vow for a short time, whether he let it grow longer, but he's, then he said he shaved it. Paul ended up getting the buzz cut. He, he, he shaved it, okay? Um, then Jesus, uh, he uses, they, the Bible uses hair uh, as a thing of things that you can't change. Can one of you change one of your, uh, you know, a hair from being uh, black to white just by thinking? You say, yeah, I go out and go get a dye and dye my hair. Well, look, that technically isn't how it should be. <laughs> you know, there was, an, there was an idea that, no, gray hair on a man, that's a, that's a good thing. It's a, a sign of, of wisdom and all, and it's, it's a crown unto him and all that stuff. And so God uses, uh, Jesus Christ used hair as an example. There's some things about you you can't change. Can you just think and all of a sudden make you add two more inches to your stature? I mean, I wish, but you can't, okay? It doesn't work like that. Um, then there's a... Uh, and you write down um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. He illustrates, you know, the, the tender care of God by using hair. Does not your heavenly Father know when, when, when he, your, the hairs on your very head are numbered? You know, and I was like, the old joke, yeah, that's, that's plus or minus. He, he knows when you grow some, he knows when you lose some. So it, it, it's, he knows every one of your hairs are numbered. That's showing you that God cares, okay? Um, and then there, do write down Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Uh, there it talks about the, the basic difference of the appearance of the man and woman in clothing and hairstyles. Um, now, throughout the time, you know, generally in our culture and custom, the, the male uh, the, generally had short hair. All right? And the female gender generally had long hair. Now, people ask, well, how long is long? Write down John chapter 12, verse 13. John chapter 12, 13, the text says that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So, so ladies, I mean, would you have hair long enough to, to wipe the feet of Jesus? I mean, hey, um, that's, that's, that's something to, to think about. Um, and then in Luke chapter 7, verse 38, um, a woman in Simon's house did the same. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head. So, I don't know how long is long. Well, there's just some examples in the Bible. Okay? Now, um, my, now obviously, that whole thing, that, that's all, look around in our society and stuff. That's, that's, it's completely different. Um, that's why it's hard to, to really enforce, well, your hair should be this length. And if it's not this length, then you're not spiritual. I'm not saying that. That's too, that's too far. Okay? Um, what else? Look at, look at, uh, Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Just get through just a couple more here. 1 Timothy 2, verse 9. I go just a little bit over. 1 Timothy 2, 9. Look what Paul says. All right, look, look, he says, In like manner also that the woman adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. Ain't that something? You know, nowadays a, a woman, they, they don't got no shamefacedness. It's all about bold and, and, and they could cuss and swear without even blushing and all that. And there's no shamefacedness in, in this culture. In sobriety. And it says, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but with, which, with women professing godliness with good works. So Paul talks about, he talks about hairstyle. Are you going to follow the, the advice are you going to follow the Apostle Paul's hairstyle? Or are you going to follow the advice from the Kardashians' hairstyle? <laughs> Most ladies nowadays, they say, I'm, going to love, I'm all about the media. I'm keeping up with the latest trends. Where well, goes our Apostle Paul? He's giving us hair advice. <laughs> what are we going to do with it? Well, you say, forget about Paul. He don't know nothing about hair. Well, all right, let's come to First Peter. 
Let's come to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, obviously, I believe that the idea is that it shouldn't be the thing that just draws all its attraction. So, I'm not, you're going to braid it, do these fancy styles, and, and I'm putting all these gems and gold. And then it's like, okay, you're just doing it for vain glory. All right, so you're going too far with, 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 this, with the hair thing. Now, look at, if you want to take Paul's advice, well, how about Peter? All right, let's try Peter. Let's try 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, look what he says in verse number 3 and 4. Now, verse number 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Now, okay, that's saying this is the, 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 the idea. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. The idea is don't put on apparel with those things that just straight up just want to draw attention the whole time. It's all about attention seeking, okay? Plating the hair and, and wearing of gold. And that's Peter's hair advice. There's Paul's hair advice. Well, you say, forget about both of them. I'm going to follow the social media hair advice. Well, then there goes the problem. <laughs> because, that, I mean, that, that's what's hard. That's Look, as a preacher and pastor, man, that, that's hard to get into everybody's business. I ain't getting in that business, all right? That's not my grounds. But that's something you got to deal with with the Lord. You come to your own standards. Husband and wife, you got to come to your own standards and stuff like that about that, that stuff, okay? So then uh, let's, let's come back. Let's finish this off here. 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen. 16. Now, both of those apostles who were closer to Jesus than we'd ever be, they emphasized that a woman should not have some elaborate hairstyle and all kinds of gold and jewelry in her hair and other expensive items that would attract attention. Okay, so that's the idea about it. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Then he goes on to verse number 16. Now, I'm going to tell you, if anybody knows me, yes, you, you knew that I had long hair. I had, I had hair 28 inches long, curly as can be. Okay, I was, like I said, I was, I was like an Absalom. I was negative. All right? And here's my, here, here was my favorite verse back when I first got saved. Here it was right here. If any man seem to be contentious, we have such no customs neither the churches of God. I said, there it goes. That's me. I'm a contentious man. I ain't letting go of my hair. I just must be contentious. Now, right away, that was the wrong thing to even say. <laughs> and the Lord said, look, I'm calling you to preach. I'm calling you to teach, to teach my word and stuff. You can't be coming up here looking like some type of crazy hippie and things like that. Well, you got to cut that hair. You got to look, look decent. Look, look decent and respect. I said, no, Lord, I ain't going to do it. Well, okay, then you ain't going to teach and preach. Then you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna have any. But you ain't gonna take you. Well, well, you you might have reached other certain people. That's look. I'm not worried about that. I, the Lord got me convicted about. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. I think it's best off for me to just keep my hair where it's at. If I came up here, you would not want to. You wouldn't even. Wouldn't even want anything to do with me. Okay. I don't want to get into all that. But that was contentious about my hair. I mean, what a weird thing contentious about my hairstyle that's a weird thing and um now you know and people pull out them arguments and stuff like that well um you know women having short hair and and well look, like we just said we just read a lot of scriptures that you'd have to flat out ignore a lot of scriptures for just a woman just to cut their hair i understand there may be exceptions some ladies they may not be able to grow their hair long or they, you know they they may have went through certain things that where they have they have to have short hair and stuff yeah okay i i can i understand that um you know, and, and considering that we don't live in a country where ladies walk around bald and the general society of men don't walk around with hair down to their backs, then the idea of the whole lesson is you ladies ought to want to look like ladies. And you men ought to want to look like men. And you men don't be looking at the ladies' hair and saying, oh, I wish my hair was that long. <laughs> I mean, that don't, that's, that's once again, that's, that's odd. That's fruity. That's weird. Okay, and then, and then a woman... Don't you look at a man and say, man, I wish I, I, wish I had his hairstyle. Because then I, then I wouldn't have to take time to, to brush it. I wouldn't have to take time to put my oils in it. I wouldn't have to take time to do wash it. It takes me 30 minutes to do my hair and stuff. Don't, so don't start envying, oh, I wish I just had short hair. When remember what the Bible just said. That you're pretty much saying, forget about my glory that God gave me. So I'm going to chop it off. I'm going to cut it short because of my convenience. I mean, hey, now, now you're, you're going a little against scriptural grounds there. So uh, the, the principle of it all is you men ought to look like men and you women ought to look like women. So I'm going to shut up with that right there. 
Alrighty. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we'd like to just thank you for your word here, Lord. And um, There's so many amazing things, Lord, in your book uh, we, we could learn that, that run clear through, Lord, to this generation. Your book is an, it's alive, it's everlasting. It knows the beginning, knows where we're at now, knows the future. Lord, we really just lift up your word here. We lift you up, Lord, and we just thank you for all the instructions. Lord, I pray that you convict each and every one of our hearts, Lord, to um, tend to the things that, that, that you spoke to us here this morning and um, help us, Lord, with our, with our uh, obedience to your word. And it's a, it's a personal thing between every individual here, Lord, and you about the matter of, of what we went over this morning. And I pray, Lord, that we take it to heart and uh, consider these things. And um, once again, Lord, we thank you for your salvation that you died for our sins on the cross and shed your blood and was buried and resurrected the third day, Lord, that we may believe upon your finished works and that alone to save us from hell, Lord. And we thank you so much. We give all praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. We're going to sing, uh, we'll close with a song here. Uh, John Paul, if you'd like to come up, we're going to sing page 505. 505. Five oh five. You got the playlist over there. Yeah. Sunday, right there. That was it. Search and right there. And it's that one. Oh, that will be glory. Five oh five. Stay for cake down there.